So um, how many know the three greatest things the Bible says is what? Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these? Love. But the other two are pretty good too, right? Faith and hope are pretty good. They're in the top three. So last week I said, I hope you leave here with a shot of courage. And today I'm saying, I hope you leave here with faith and hope, with an increase of faith and hope. Because that was another thing that came out at the meeting we were with, at, uh, with Chuck Pierce in Pennsylvania. And he uh, had this awesome worship leader there, a guy named Jamie Fitt. And, and they just kept saying, speak it out. Let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. It was such a good word for this season that we're in right now. So faith and hope does that, right? And you all probably know Hebrews 11.1. 1. It says, now is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of what we can't see. Now that's pretty cool, isn't it? That we're serving a God that gives us so much faith that, that it's a substance. It's tangible. It's something that you can hold on to. And there's evidence there that you believe it by the way you live your life. Even if you don't see it, you're walking by faith, not by sight. I don't wait till I see it and then believe it. I believe it and then see it. That's what the Lord is saying. And the devil would love to discourage us. And now with two weeks and two days, I guess it is, right until the election, uh, the swirling's going on even greater. So boy, do we need hope. Boy, do we need faith in the midst of this. And, and what I believe is identity theft is one of the main ways the enemy has been trying to attack us. And, and that's why I said, no, we're, we're decreeing today that it's exposed. Identity theft is exposed. I'm not first an Italian-American or white or whatever other label. I'm first a child of God. And that's what we have to hold on to. That's the anchor of our soul. It doesn't mean we ignore our differences. We celebrate our differences. And nobody taught this or lived it better than Jesus, that everybody was treated the same. Even lepers who weren't allowed to be touched in those days, he would touch them and heal them. Nobody was off limits to the love of God. What about us? Let's start by looking in the mirror. Where am I not loving people the way God would love them? And let's just do that. And if we just model it, other people will be drawn to it. And praise the Lord that, you know, this is going to pass. The thing that we're going through now is going to pass. But the word of God is going to remain. So this is a time of testing and why we need our faith and hope. So last week was courage because you sure need that too right now. And then faith and hope is what the Lord put on my heart. And I'm going to use a couple of different scripture examples around that today. And I asked Carolyn too to join me for part of what we're going to talk about today because it's really important to make decrees to to minister in the opposite spirit of what's swirling around you. Because if you don't, you know the laws of inertia? If you know it, just raise your hand. Just humor me for a minute. Have you ever heard that word, right? It's things in motion stay in motion, things that stay at rest, right? How many of you want to stay in motion for God? Right. Because once you get stagnant and you get inertia, you're not standing still. You're actually sliding backwards. There's no medium in the Lord. You're either hot or cold, lukewarm, you get spit out of his mouth, right? So we're either moving forward in him or we're going backwards. And I choose to move forward and I'm not going to let the inertia of the world corrupt my spirit and make me think, oh, it's not even worth worrying about all this stuff. It's just hopeless. It's never going to change. Some people are even saying we're going to have a civil war. Like I never thought I'd hear those words. If it's a contested election, you know, all these things. You know what the what if game can make you crazy? What if God? That's what you should just say. End the story. What if God? I'm not saying don't plan. That's my career. I've been a financial planner for 30 plus years. So I get the value of that. And, and God's word talks about that. Count the cost. But not overriding the power of God to show up and change things. And that's what we're believing. That's what we're believing for. So I'll. I gave you, a, I said, a double shot this week. Last week was a shot of courage. Today's a double shot. When I get coffee from my wife, she says, get me two shots of espresso in that coffee. So she's a double shot kind of lady. Faith and hope. <laughs> All right. So I'm sorry, I know, like, I've been asking you to do this a lot, but it's, again, it's the power of our decree. Say this with me, okay? I am the currency of God's kingdom. All right, so I'm going to try to get you to think that way. Paul said it in Corinthians. He said, I will gladly spend and be spent. That's a pretty cool thing, isn't it? 
He said, I'm going to pour myself out like a drink offering in another portion of Scripture. I'm going to make myself available to God. Another mentor that I really looked up to is a guy named John Wimber, died in 1997, but he said that we're all like change in God's pocket, and he can spend us wherever he wants. That's a great way to think about it. If he wants a Coca-Cola today, I get dropped in, the, in that vending machine. And I don't think he, God would want a Coca-Cola, but just using it as an example. And as we act as this kingdom currency, wealth is created for God's kingdom. Because investments create wealth. And economies create wealth. So we're operating off of God's economy, not the world's economy. And there is a prince of darkness and a prince of this world who thinks he has power and thinks he has authority, the only power he has is lies. He has no authority. God has given us all authority, the Bible says, and the only way we lose it is if we believe the lie. And you believe the lie if you don't know the word, because it's the truth. And once we know the truth about us, boy, I'll tell you, the enemy does not want us to know the truth about ourselves. That's why suicide is up. Because he can rob people. He can steal their identity. He can call people names and other people can say it and hop on that bandwagon and say, no, I'm going to say what God says about me. I'm not going to repeat lies about me or even things that people said over me. I'm going to put myself in the Word of God and what God says about me, that's who I choose to believe. We sang it last week. I know who I am. I'm walking in power. I work in miracles. I live a life of favor because I know who I am. Do you? Yes. yes, Terry, thank you. So you, you probably are very familiar with some of these scriptures I'm going to give because Jesus modeled this kingdom currency lifestyle. And the way he did it, he didn't just love the lepers. He also loved the Pharisees enough not to just condemn them. He tried to give them parables and analogies that would cause them to have to think. And here's one really important, like, rule. You know, there's rules of engagement in a battle. And I'm sorry if you don't like the idea of warfare in the battle, but the Bible's just full of this language. And when Satan convinced Adam and Eve to sin, it created a war. Sorry. I, I'd rather just have, you know, popcorn and ice cream the rest of my life. Life, life is not like that. If you're going to get in the ring and fight somebody, you better be in good shape. So there's a war going on. You just got to recognize that. And God wins. And we're on his side. <laughs> Doesn't mean you won't still deal with some problems, okay? So one of the ways they, they would try to arrest him is to trap him into saying something that they could use against him. And the king over their region was Caesar, right? The emperor of the Roman Empire. So in this case, I'm in Mark chapter 12, if you want to go there. I'm using the voice version. It says, the Pharisees couldn't figure out how to lay, or, lay their hands on Jesus because they were afraid the people would rise up against them. Because people recognized truth. And they recognized Jesus was who he said he was. So they left him alone and they went away furious. So when you operate in kingdom authority, the devil is furious. That's not a reason to be afraid, but it's a reason to have faith and hope. Because you need to know who you are. If the devil can rock your confidence in who you are, you're not going to walk in your full power. And the body of Christ needs each other. Yes. Look at somebody near you and say, I need you, I need you. To, operate to operate in your full capacity. Full capacity. And you need me, you need me. To, operate to operate in my full capacity. My full capacity. Oh, that's a heavy statement. Yes, Let me tell you, you could say, no, I don't. I'm fine. I'm doing fine. Well, you might be doing fine today, but the Bible in Matthew chapter 5 says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Right? That could be you get some bad news and all of a sudden you're, you're not feeling so good because you're depressed about something. And that's when Cheryl, uh, like Cheryl Bolden, a lot of times when we're rehearsing for, uh, for worship, she'll just get so touched by the lyrics and the songs that we're singing that just even in rehearsal, she'll start to weep. And that blesses me because she's sensitive like that. And it's not, she's not just showing up to do the thing again. Right? And that's what we do for each other, not just when we're together, but when we pray for each other. So iron sharpens iron. We're in this thing together, and we need each other. And if ever there was a time we knew that we needed each other, forsake not the assembling together. That's what the devil's been trying to do. I read a statistic that one in five churches are at risk of having to close because of COVID. 
So they went away furious because they couldn't figure out how to trick Jesus. I'm getting a little bit of feedback up here. I don't know where Phil is, but if you hear me, I could use some help. It says, then some of the Pharisees banded together to try to trap Jesus. I got to say, every time they tried, they failed. <laughs> and over and over in the New Testament, it says they asked him no more questions after that. But they kept on trying. They kept trying to trick him. So they came and they said, we know that you're truthful in what you say and you don't play favorites. You're not worried what other people think about you, so you teach total honesty. They're just totally buttering him up. And uh, they said, so tell us this. Is it lawful that the Jews should pay taxes to Caesar? Now, if he says no, what are they going to say to the local authorities? He's stirring up trouble. He's telling the people not to pay their taxes. So you need to arrest him and get him off the street because they knew the people understood who Jesus was, so they needed to come up with a charge against him. And he's just way too in, into the moment to be worried about that. Maybe if I move this away. Let's try it. It can't hurt. Maybe it'll help. Sounds like it's helping. Good deal. So he says, they say, should we give or not? And Jesus, in the voice, it says, seeing through their ruse. Isn't that a beautiful thing? When you can see in the spirit? That's a gift of discernment. That's what the Holy Spirit does for you. Because you pray, because you're not in your flesh, but you're walking in the spirit, you can see past the package, good and bad. Because if you meet somebody who's hurting, you can also see past that package, and you can call out the thing God sees in them. But when it's illegal like this, when it's a lie, you're also discerning. And he, they call it a R-U-S-E, a ruse. It was a trap. They were trying to trick them. And he said, why do you test me like this? Bring me a coin so that I could take a look at it. And when they had brought the coin to him, he asked him another question. He said, tell me, whose image is on this coin? And of whom does that inscription speak? Now, you, might know, you may not know what the inscription was, because I only found this out pretty recently. Caesar was called the Son of God. And it was right on the coin. You can look it up. You can Google it. I don't say anything without Googling it first anymore because <laughs> people are going to challenge you. That's a good thing. So remember when the Roman centurions saw what happened after Jesus died on the cross and said, truly, this was the Son of God. There's a whole lot more to it because they've been saying Caesar was the Son of God. And that's why the Pharisees were so worried that if there was this revolution of Jesus, they were going to lose their position strongholds, right? We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. But who's higher than the high place? That's right. And Holy Spirit and the truth of the word of God. So you need to keep your footing. When you're trying to be thrown off, you got to be sure-footed. I walk by faith, not by sight. I have hope. I'm not getting discouraged. Even though it doesn't look good right now, I'm not getting discouraged. Hmm. So what does Jesus say? Whose image is on that coin? It's about Caesar. So give unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and then give unto God what is God's. And I've heard a couple of other people say this, so this is not an original thought, what I'm about to say. Jesus could have said, whose image is on you? We know whose image is on the coin, but whose image is on you? What's the answer? Wow. Jesus, right? First, so 2 Corinthians 3.18, we are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord. So where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. It's all tied in that same verse. So if you need a mission for your life, it's to be transformed into the image of Christ. But boy, I'll tell you what, if they can rob your identity through the culture, if you can listen to enough you know what an echo chamber is as, they re as it relates to social media and all? It's that if you only stay on one side of the equation and you have no idea what the other people believe, you get it in an echo chamber, and it, and it starts to reinforce. And, and look, it's very defiling to read the other side of the argument. But if you love them, like Jesus knew the law better than the Pharisees did. So you need to ask the Lord to help you to say, I don't want to hate these people because you don't hate anybody. You don't want one person to perish. I want to be able to stand firm in the midst of the opposition, but also deliver a word to them that's from you 
that will be like life, like Jesus did with them. You give unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and you give unto God what is God's, and what is God's is you. Me and you. We're the currency that he uses in the kingdom to create the wealth of redeemed lives. So many people have come to our church over the years, and we, when they went through the training that we do called Possessing Your Vessel, they said, I've been a Christian all these years. How come nobody ever taught me this stuff? And it's so crucial, and it's so essential, and I don't want to criticize other people for not teaching it. I just want to say that we recognized that being a Christian is the biggest hope is not just dying and going to heaven and then being miserable while you're here, okay? The biggest hope is to be like Christ while you're here. He said, occupy until I come. Don't be waiting with an SOS. Hurry up. Come back, Jesus. Get me out of here. No, we're a force for good. We're a force for change, a dynamic force for change. Ecclesia and dunamis power. If we're willing to, to go into the hurting places of the world. Jesus went to the hurting places of the world. Nobody was too far away from God for him to talk to. And he said the children are the best example. Like they, I, I, I would love to do a video one time, and I would love to have children from all different ethnic groups laughing on tape and try to ask people if you could tell who was Asian, who was black, who was white, who's Italian. You can't tell the difference. I tried it. The laugh sounds the same. That's how Jesus saw people. That's the beauty of the innocence of the child. We're not supposed to be childish, but childlike. And say, God, you love this person, even though they're acting like a total whatever, fill in the blank, be kind. They're not making a lot of sense right now, but I'm going to help them see how to make more sense. If you start there, believe the best, that's a good place to start. doesn't mean that it's going to work for everybody, but... It really helps if you're a man and woman after God's heart on how to do these things. So this is what I wrote for today um, that, that goes up after we post the video about what we're going to talk about. Carolyn, you can come up. I'm just going to read something here. And you can bring that microphone. All right, so this is what it says. The contentious atmosphere in America has been driven in part over arguments about our identity. Would you agree? And that's why I've been focusing on that now is my first identity is the most important thing. I'm first a Christian. That's what the word teaches. But I'm also going to help Carolyn come up Thank the stairs you. here. Thank you. You're welcome. We went to the same high school. Yeah. Graduated the same year. She just looks way better than I do. All right. That's how that goes. All right. So maybe one of the things that they're talking about in culture that I have noticed too, and especially in the business world, is people will say, well, speaking as, Carolyn might say, a black woman, yeah. my opinion about it is this. Or I might say, speaking as a financial advisor, uh, my opinion is this. But what I want us to say is speaking as a Christian. Yes. I'm going to tell the truth of what the Word says Amen. based on how the Holy Spirit shows me. Amen. Because I know who I am. And yes, Carolyn is an African-American and I'm a white man. And, and those two people aren't supposed to be doing this right now, but we are. My All brother, right? my brother. We're right. We're siblings <laughs> in the kingdom. Amen. And we both look like our father. How cool is that? Yes. <laughs> All right. So this is the rest of what I wrote. As Christians, there should be no confusion over our primary identity. Amen. We have been crucified with Christ so that old man died. Nevertheless, I live. <clears throat> We've experienced a second birth, so I can call her sister Amen. as part of the family of God. Amen. Second birth as sons and daughters, regardless of our ethnicity, our gender, or our social class. Amen. And Amen. all the other ways that people are trying to slice up the culture to, to say, how do you identify? And they're bringing things into the curriculum in the school to confuse little children Jesus. about whether they're even a boy or a girl. Lord have mercy. And they have the audacity to say that scientists are seeing no biological difference between a boy and a girl. Lord I, mean, have mercy. I, I couldn't even make that up. It's true. I could send you the article if you want it. It's true. 
But that's what I meant. It's like defiling to try to think about all this stuff. And why you have to keep coming back to say, now faith is. Yeah. Now. Now faith. now faith is. The substance of what I'm hoping for. The evidence of what I don't yet see. But this is a picture of what we're hoping to see. Amen. Right? Amen. We're first Christians. Amen. That's what we have to always convey to people. And redeemed sons and daughters. Can you say that? Redeemed, redeemed sons, sons and, and daughters. daughters. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I've been redeemed yes. by the blood of the Lamb. By the blood of the Lamb. And this is my sister. Amen. Not my enemy. Because your 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 professional life involves sure. a lot of this. So you know, I had to reckon with this myself. You know, one day I had to recognize who I really am. And if you are in, engulfed in this culture, it will convince you that because of the way you look, where you came from, what your experiences have been, that defines who you are. But when we come into a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, we're no longer bound. We've been set free. And he who the Son sets free is free indeed. It's no longer I that live, but Christ in me, the hope of glory. And I was talking to Pastor Peter yesterday, and he was mentioning what he was going to minister on. And I had an uh, experience to meet Harriet Tubman's uh, descendants last week. And as we encountered them, it brought to memory, not memory, but they brought up some of her quotes. And it just jarred me to go back and look at the movie. And when I went back and looked at the movie, it was clear as day. Harriet Tubman knew who she was. Right. She was a child of God. She first. said, first, first, first. And when they came to her and said, well, you can't do it. You can't tell me what I can't do. <laughs> I know who I am. <laughs> and she, she listened to the voice of God. And there's a quote she says, Pastor, and I'm going to be done. She said that she freed a thousand slaves. She could have freed a thousand more if they knew they were slaves. That's a picture of what's happening in our culture right now. People are bound by ideologies, mindsets, and, and issues, and things that others have said, this is who you are. But that's enslavement. And if they encounter the living God, they'll realize, this is not even my home. My home is in the kingdom. I am a royalty. I have a heavenly father. He has all power. He has all authority. He has delivered me from sin and death. Therefore, I fear no man. Right. I am free to be who he's called me to be in Jesus' name. So I just want to, I want to say a prayer, okay? Because Carolyn is on the front lines every day, you know, dealing with confused people uh, through the ministry that she started 18 years now? Yeah, 20. Eight, 20 years ago. So we're not saying that there aren't problems in the country, okay? Nobody's denying that there's problems, but we are saying the only way to solve them is through the Lord. Amen. You cannot make government your God. That's right. Sorry, they're going to let you down. That's right. Both sides, right? It's a, seek first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness. not the kingdom of government, Amen. right? Don't back things up that are destroying the nuclear family. If it says that's one of our purposes, to, to destroy the nuclear family, Jesus. that's to rob us of our identity. And that's the fastest way to make people slaves, is to give them an orphan spirit. That's right. Guess who had that? The devil. Yes, he did. He got kicked out of heaven for rebellion. He was an orphan in the earth. So he can't create life, but he can destroy life. Amen. So the wages of sin is what? Death. So the wealth of Satan's kingdom is destroyed lives. There's the war. We're here to redeem lives through God in us, not us. But as we allow the Lord to work through us, we can see change in America. Amen. Or anywhere else that we go, but only if we stick to the basic principles of the word of God. Amen. You're not first a black woman. 
How many different ways can we slice that pie? Mm. A lot of different ways. Yeah. And at one point or another, somebody's going to say, yeah, but I'm more oppressed than you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we're free now. Amen. In Christ. Hallelujah. We're going to work towards the change Amen. to get more people free. Amen. First in the spirit. Yes. Most important thing is to know who you are first in Christ. So I would just like to release a prayer of yeah. unity, but I'd like you to start and then I'll, okay. and I'll follow up. Could you just lift your hand? Let's so take part in this. Father, in Jesus' precious name, you created each one of us in your image, and our blood is all the same color. It's yes. red. Yes. Absolutely nothing can separate us from your love. And Father, I thank you for the privilege of being in your kingdom. I thank you for the privilege of the family of God that you have connected me with. And Lord, I thank you that you have rooted me in who I am in you as a child of the most high God. And so Father, right now in Jesus' precious name, we release that identity in this place. We say let it resonate throughout this whole community that people arise and say, I am not this, I am not that. I am a child of God. Therefore, I have privilege and I have responsibility. And so, Father, I thank you, Lord, for the awakening that's coming in our nation, that many will arise afresh and anew to who they are. We are one. We are one. We are one in Jesus' name. And Lord, we ask you to expose the identity theft and the orphan spirit in our culture. And I also feel that I should repent on behalf of the church because the Bible says let judgment begin in the house of the Lord. And there's no way to reconcile segregated churches. No, no. Not, se not Christian churches. Not, if we're following Christ, segregation should have never happened, and it did. And that gives the world something to look at and say, well, you're not even practicing what you preach. Jesus. And we never had that position, but I'm a minister. We're both ministers, so... On behalf of ministers that did that, and I'm sure I haven't treated every single person in my whole life exactly the right way either. So it's got to start with us. So we say, Lord, we're sorry. On behalf of the body of Christ, on behalf of the church, if we never, if we misrepresented you in any way, in the way we treated other people, if we, we didn't celebrate them and we just tolerated them or barely tolerated them, but we ask you to shift the church. Yes, Lord. Let us be the example like somebody like Martin Luther King Jr. able to represent. And Lord, we bless his memory. We bless the brilliance of his writing and the influence that he had. But we ask you to raise up the next generation yes, of Christian leaders yes, that will speak into the culture yes, Lord. and let it come through the church, the yes. ecclesia, the kingdom of God. We know that's where the answer lies because we can cry out, Abba, Father, Hallelujah. sons and daughters. Hallelujah. Lord, forgive us. And we are calling on your name, and we do ask you to heal our land today. Yes, Father. Today. Yes. Today. Would you today, today. Heal, our land. heal our land? Amen. 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 Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. I have a good day. Thank you. It's not exactly the best steps. All right. I only have a few more to go. But I just try to help you with things that have helped me along the way. And, and these days, I've been meeting a lot of seekers, a lot of people that aren't Christians yet, and they have really tough questions. And I work on Wall Street, and a lot of them are in that Wall Street world, and those people tend to have high IQs, and, you know, they're very analytical. So when they come with a question, you better give them an answer. And you better be able to back it up. And that's really good, right? That's what I was saying. Iron sharpens iron. So you got to be able to say, bring it on, devil. What you got? You got to deal if you want to heal. <laughs> that's what Robin Vincent said. I'm not taking credit for that one, but that's a good one, isn't it? You want to heal, you got to deal. And they don't like hearing the truth sometimes, but that's okay. Jesus was able to deliver the truth with love, even when it hurt. So here's the first one that I always try to remember. It's from 2 Peter chapter 1. It says, God has given us the ability to be partakers of the divine nature. All right, so look at somebody and say, you are a partaker of the divine nature. That's really good news, man, I'll tell you. That means the Spirit of God is living on the inside of you. But you still have to make a choice to submit to the divine nature and not to your flesh. And I don't think there's anything more 
ready to pull your flesh out than Facebook. Let's just say that right up front. That's why we try to post a lot of redeeming videos on Facebook to put something good out there in the midst of all that chaos. But no, I'm operating when I choose to submit to the divine nature that God placed in me. We already quoted Ephesians 6, 12, but you should memorize it, right? It says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So the person who's giving me a hard time right now is not my enemy. But in the moment that you're, you're getting heated up and it's starting to expand, the temperature in the room is getting a little hotter, it's, it's growing into an argument from a discussion, that's when you remember, I'm not wrestling against this person. There's a spirit here that's trying to bring division. I'm bringing the Holy Spirit in because then in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, it says the weapons of our warfare are not in this natural realm. They are mighty through God to demolish the stronghold of opposition. And look, a lot of times the people that know the other side of the argument know, know that argument really well. And you have to come with the truth of, have you ever considered this? Just was doing this yesterday. You know, you're taking that same role that Jesus had with the Pharisees. Bring me the coin. Whose image is on it? Well, fair enough. Give to Caesar what's his, but then give to God what is God's. And then he leaves it alone. And then they're saying, yeah, but whose image is on me, right? Like, isn't that brilliant? You don't have to give them all the answers. You just have to be able to love them in the middle of the, of the heated conversation. And then just, oh, God, I call this the 38 special. You all know what that is, those of you that are okay with firearms. 1 John 3, 8, 38 special. <laughs> For this purpose, the Son of God was manifest, that he might destroy the works of the enemy. As the Father sent me, so I send you. So what are you supposed to do? Destroy the works of the enemy. Start in the mirror. <laughs> Good place to start. You're not going to be perfect. That's okay. He doesn't need you to be perfect. He just needs you to be after his heart. That's the goal every day. Lord, help me be after your heart. And then 1 Timothy. Man, I love this one too. 118. This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child. There, there's the family piece again, right? Paul is speaking to Timothy as a spiritual son. I'm, 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 in, I'm, I'm being a father to you right now, and I'm giving you a father's blessing that in accordance with the prophecies that were spoken over you, that by them you might wage the good warfare. There's a lot of language in the Bible about warfare. Not to be afraid of it. We're not to be shrinking back from it. We're to say, Lord, it's not by my might. It's not by my power. How is this going to, get ha going, to, going to happen? It's through the Spirit of the Lord that you put inside of me. All right, just a few more verses. You good? All right, the people out in the sun look a lot better than the people in here. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. Say, let us. This is not a BLT, let us. This is let us. Let us. It's, it's going to happen three times in three verses. Let us. That's an encouragement. It's an exhortation to do something. Let us draw near. To who? To God. Let us draw near with true hearts, full of faith. Hearts that have been rinsed of an evil conscience. And with bodies that have been cleansed, that have been offered up to the Lord as a sacrifice. And then let us hold strong. This is verse 23 in Hebrews 10. Let us hold strong to the confession of our hope. Watch what you say. Guard your mouth. You've been given two ears and one mouth. Do twice as much listening as speaking. Ooh, this is tough though, right? Hold strong to the confession of your hope. Never wavering. Never wavering. Since the one who promised it to us is faithful. Let us consider how to spur one another on. Now, we're not living out west with the horses, but you know what spurs are, right? On the back of the cowboy boots, and that's what they poke each other. Spur Danny on. Not being physically violent, but just encourage one another. Let us spur one another on to what? To each other? To give greater love and righteous deeds, not forgetting to gather, not forgetting to assemble together as a community. It's one of the big weapons the enemy's used in these last seven months is to stop us.
from coming together to worship together and pray for one another. So I commend all of you that looked at the temperature and said, oh, I don't know, it looks pretty cold. And it was, wasn't it? You don't look too cold out there, y'all. You look pretty good. I don't see any bathing suits yet, but that's all right. I'm glad I don't, frankly. Nothing personal. I'm, I'm, I know what time it is, so I don't want to keep this too long, but there's just a few more things that I really want to make sure I say before we're done. And it kind of touches on what I said earlier that maybe you thought I was just kind of making it up on the fly when I said, I need Danny to be operating at his full capacity as a Christian, and he needs me to be doing that. We won't always be, but that should be our goal because I can't do what he does and he can't do what I do. So we have to look not just at our own state of mind and, and state of the union, but we have to look at each other. And the reason we come together is to help each other grow in Christ-likeness. And it's not because you're better than anybody else. It's just because we're all in this together. And we need each other. And Paul just does a beautiful job of explaining the purpose of the church. But it's really the purpose of the ecclesia. You all know what the difference? There's two, two different words used for church. One is oikos, which is the family side of the church. The other is ecclesia. We have a great video by Dutch Sheets on our YouTube channel. If you want to know more about this, I can tell you how to get there, okay? But the idea is we need the family part, but we also need the military part of the sending. And we have to take authority. And one puts 1,000, but two put 10,000. So if he's not operating at full speed and I'm not, we're not driving the same force that we would be if we're operating as mature Christians. So in Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, Paul said that God gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Why? For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry. But it's the work of your ministry, not the work of the ministry, I think. That's my interpretation, and I can back that up. So you have a ministry. Do you know that? You don't have to have a formal title. You're a Christian. You carry the Spirit of God. <coughs> Excuse me. So he gave these offices. <coughs> I'm sorry. Excuse me. And then he lays out this beautiful thing of what's supposed to happen in the church. I already repented on behalf of the church. I'm not saying we always get it all right. But we want to be open to what you all are feeling, what you're sensing, what you're seeing. I haven't always been in church cultures like that where it's my way or the highway sometimes. No, we're saying, how can we spur you on? How can we spur one another on? What's the gift that you see inside of you? We'll, sh we'll share what we see in you. And let's grow together as we act this out. That's partly why we're going to be feeding people over the holidays. We need to get outside the church and go meet the culture where they're at. It doesn't take a lot of Bible knowledge to hand a bag of food to somebody, does it? So he said the reason that God gave those five gifts is until we're all in the unity of the faith, filled with the knowledge of the Son of God, and we can stand mature in his teachings and fully formed in the likeness of Jesus, our liberating king. Isn't that a great name for Jesus? Our liberating king. So uh, we had a keyboard player for many years named Liju. And he got, you know, we were praying for him financially and he got a promotion, but it required him to move to Tennessee. And when he was leaving, I hated to see him go. A lot of you know that I hated to see him go because uh, he was such a gifted guy and such, he's a blessing. But we're talking about the kingdom, right? So we were praying for him to get the promotion. And we didn't say, but only in New Jersey, God. You know, like, that's witchcraft, man. That's like controlling prayer. But I, I didn't want to see him go. But he's like, we grew so much, we grew so much while we were here. That's got to be one of the greatest compliments. We have, a, we have a deeper, richer relationship with the Lord while we were here. Because let me tell you, you're not our church. You're his church. So you might only be here for a season. But while you're here, we want you to grow. We want your immune system to strengthen against sin. And we want each other to do that, right? We want to do that for one another. Why? That will no longer be like children, tossed here and there by ocean waves, picked up by every gust of religious teaching. 
spoken by liars or swindlers or deceivers. You know, Paul was straight up, wasn't he? Instead, by the truth spoken in love, we're to grow every way into him, the anointed one, the head. He joins and holds together the whole body. So each part works to its proper design. Can you stand? Look at somebody near you. And say, I want to see your part flourish. I pray. You can say this to them. I pray for you. That you will know the reason why you were called into the kingdom. And that you will bear much fruit for the kingdom of God. You got a little more left? Yeah. All right, I'm almost done. It's the last time, last portion of the scripture. And you could say this to me, but you could also say it to the person near you. Even though you were once distant from God, living in the shadows of your evil thoughts and actions, He redeemed you and connected you back to Himself. He released His supernatural peace to you. through the sacrifice of his body as a sin payment on your behalf so that you would dwell in his presence. Now there's nothing between you and God. He sees you holy, flawless, restored. I think we need to say that again. He sees you Holy, flawless, restored, never shaken from the hope of the gospel that you have believed in. All right, lift them up. Lord, I bless your people. I bless this ruling, governing authority. I bless the ambassadors of Christ that are part of this body of believers. And anybody who's watching, we're not just taking up space to evacuate. We're here to occupy. That's the kingdom purpose of the church. Let's get outside the church and bring Jesus to the lost people that are all around us that are hurting. But in the meantime, don't forsake the assembling together. Amen. Lord, I bless your people. I ask you to send them out with strength today. If there's anybody here that doesn't know the Lord, we would love to introduce you to him. It's a simple prayer of invitation, inviting him in. Come up to the altar. I'll stay six feet away. But I have a loud voice. I bless you, church, to go in grace, in peace, and in power. Have an awesome day.